Our next speaker is Joe Ortego. Joe is the past chair of this network, and he is the chair of Nixon Peabody's Products Class Action and Industry and Trade Representation Practice Group. He has defended major commercial, environmental, and toxic tort cases um, against financial institutions and automobile companies, as well as chemical companies. He's a former New York assistant district attorney under the famous Rob, Robert Morgenthau. Of course, Robert Morgenthau was so old, a lot of people were under him for a long time. <laughs> he has a list of publications a mile long on ethics, e-discovery, cloud computing, civil procedure, and more. He leads the Nixon Peabody trial trial team, which is composed of the firm's most successful and experienced trial lawyers. He is also a member of the firm's Diversity Action Committee. He is an active pro bono legal service provider, president of the Board of Trustees of Adults and Children with Learning and Developmental Disabilities, director of TIPS, National Trial Academy, and much, much more. Speaking today on the topic of government surveillance, timely, Please welcome Joe Ortego. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start off with a quote this morning. Those who surrender freedom for security will not have, nor they deserve, either one. Benjamin Franklin, an old quote, but still quite realistic. Well, the debate, privacy versus security. I liked getting involved in this debate because it brought me back to college. I was sitting there with my Levi jeans, red flannel shirt, my fry boots, and my big afro. And I was very happy to bring back to those intellectual days of intellectual debate. And don't make fun of the afro, it's long gone and the hair is slowly slipping away. But why are we talking about this? It's current events and recent events have now led us to believe that maybe this is more than an intellectual argument for us. Maybe there's more to it. It's just not a college room, classroom discussion. So you say to yourself, you know, we're lawyers. I'm outside counsel, developing business, working on cases, trying cases. You're in-house counsel. You're working on representing your clients. Why do you really care about this intellectual debate of privacy versus security? I'll tell you why you care because it triggers off some ethical duties to all of us in this room, whether we're in-house counsel or outside counsel, that we must do. We need to protect the communications of our clients. We need to protect and advise our clients about that and the availability of their information. And we also have to advise our clients about what happens if they are foreign clients and how vulnerable their communications can be to the U.S. government and others. And we also need to advise our good old U.S. clients who think they're safe and happy that when they have conversations with foreigners or perceived foreigners, what they're saying and doing is very vulnerable and aware. And as lawyers, why do we care? Well, I know in law school we all wanted to protect the Constitution and be excited about that, but I'll tell you why you also care. Because the first client that has their communications revealed that you didn't protect the attorney-client privilege, and the first client that you don't advise about these things, and they get caught up in the dragnet, your reputation shall be shattered. And let's be realistic. All we have as lawyers are our reputations. You can build a reputation for 30 years, and you can lose it in a day. Let's talk a little about this. Uh, what do we want to do today? Okay, I. I'm not going to be the college professor today. We're not going to talk about the good old days. The afro's gone. The fry boots are back in style, but I don't have a pair anymore. What I'd like to talk about today is what kind of data is being exposed in today's dragnet, what are the obligations of lawyers have to tell their clients, and what can we do to protect our clients from this new age of surveillance. Well, what, how did this all happen? What, how did it start? Well, it started with a guy named Edward Snowden, former NSA analyst, leaked secret documents and exposed various government surveillance operations that all of us as Americans were shocked to hear about. I was. Someone once mentioned it to me, and I said, nah, that doesn't happen here. I was shocked. 
and it revealed that the U.S. government has an indiscriminate dragnet surveillance system in place. And who was Edward Snowden? Well, I'll bring you back to my era, too. Well, he's the deep throat. Now we had Watergate, the deep throat. Some of us remember that. And now we have Edward Snowden, who's created the firestorm. And if you think this is kind of funny and a joke in some ways, and you think it's not going to happen to me or you, why don't you ask Private Bradley Manning, of those who follow the news. He was a first class, uh, private first class, small guy in Iraq. He had access to databases used by the U.S. government to transmit information. So he leaked it to WikiLeaks, a not-for-profit organization that publishes this type of information. He is facing imprisonment for life. It looks like they've cut a deal. He's going to go to jail for life. Some 19-year-old kid who did something stupid. So if you don't think there's ramifications, you sit there as an educated lawyer, you think about what you have to do and what your obligations are. What is the government watching, OK? OK, they're looking at your phone. They're looking at your in and internet, everything you do on the internet, from Skype down, everything you conceive of. OK, feel confident. They're not looking at the content. They're looking at the metadata. OK, they're not listening to the content, the metadata. Before you get excited about that, that your client's metadata is only being looked at, think twice. Because Big Brother's best friend is your cell phone. Your cell phone is Big Brother's best friend. Why? Because it tells everything about you, where you are, how you are, who you communicated with, what you're doing, where you eat, where you live. Well, let's say if we're in a communist country, not this beautiful U.S. of A. where we have the Fourth Amendment protection. Let's say you're in communist China and President Xi Jinping wanted to know who was at a particular demonstration. All he would have to do was check the cell phones of people and it would indicate who was at that location at that time and would know everyone was at the demonstration. But don't worry, we're in the United States. No one is looking at your cell phone to determine what you're doing. What's being exposed? Well, the dragnet is quite great. It, you know, you know what Verizon was ordered to produce a tremendous amount of information about a, a bunch of people. Now you say, okay, metadata is okay. That's all right. We got past the metadata issue. But this dragnet was for foreigners, right? So I'm not a foreigner. I'm a good U.S. citizen. I don't have to worry about anything. Well, there are no restrictions because you as a U.S. citizen, if you are having conversations with a foreigner who they've determined they need to watch, your metadata is dragged in with everyone else's metadata. And we'll talk a little about the standards. So the dragnet includes everyone. So when you look at Verizon and you say to yourself, well, none of my communications are involved. I'm a good old US citizen. It doesn't work that way necessarily. Now, you also say to yourself, well, it's Verizon, poor Verizon. It's only Verizon. They're the only folks that are involved in this. I don't have Verizon. My clients don't use Verizon. They use AT&T. Very good. Take another nap, you're in trouble. Because Verizon, if you believe Verizon is the only one being asked to produce these records, I think you're naive. It's unlikely that Verizon is the only person. And the court order, the reason why Verizon, poor Verizon gets in the news about this is because that's the person that Snowden leaked about. We must assume that every internet provider, every phone provider, is subject to this dragnet and the communications are available. Your communications with your clients are available and the metadata of those are available. What is PRISM? Okay, PRISM is another program revealed by Snowden's documents. It's a code name for data collection by the NSA. And PRISM is NSA's number one source of raw intelligence. And look at what they allow surveillance on. Email, videos, Skype. I'm sure Ellis will be happy to know that the presentation of his lawyers are probably being viewed right now by the NSA. Very interesting stuff, I assume, right? They want Sharman's stuff, not mine. Uh, notwithstanding that, it's raw intelligence. That is the source of their information. Okay, what is being exposed? Well, originally, you said the gov prison was a difficult situation because it became difficult to get individual warrants. So I call the government got what was called the home field advantage. That enabled them to get a different standard to determine whether or not they can snoop with regard to this information. And now the standard is anyone reasonably believed to be a foreigner at the time, you can get the warrant or you can get the order to snoop on their information. That's a low bar to overcome. 
And how do they base it on? It's 50-50, as Fitzpatrick would say at trial. 50-50, meaning 50-50, meaning it, you're exposed. And how do they look at it? They look at the IP addresses to determine who's a foreign and who they can snoop on. And if they look at the IP address, um, take a look at that IP address, and you can't figure out where the IP address is. Well, the presumption is that if you don't know and you can't figure out the address of the IP address, the presumption is there's a foreigner. Our Canadian friends from the network who I'm watching there should be worried. I'm not going to converse with you, sir, later today. <laughs> Those communist, communist Canadians, that's very worried. The socialism is coming across. How can you tell from cyberspace who is an American, who's a foreigner? I don't know. The NSA may not intentionally target an American, but the NSA can obtain the private communications of Americans as part of their request. If, that, if they're targeting a foreigner, you get dragged in as well. Now, you look at this and you say to yourself, ah, look at this. Pick this picture. Uh, I cut this out of a photo and I was worried if I wouldn't be politically correct because these are the only people we're supposed to be afraid of. Of course not. But what makes you think these are not Americans? Is this enough now at this point in time to snoop on anyone who looks different or anybody different? In the training manuals at the NSA, which Snowden leaked, says, don't worry about anything. If you accidentally collect non-foreign U.S. data, it's okay. Err on the side of collecting, not collecting. So that's what you have to deal with on this, with this. Everything is vulnerable. And you know, Uncle Sam has, your, has friends. Now, you don't think we are very nice and generous people. We, are very, we share everything with everyone, including our guilt. Well, we share the data we get with at least the British, because Snowden revealed that the British have this. And outside the U.S., your data is even going outside the U.S. to other government agencies. And if you think that uh, we don't share with other countries besides Britain, I think we're also naive. So your data and your conversation with your client is going to a lot of different places, places that don't have Fourth Amendment rights or democracy. No worries, Uncle Sam has our back. So you know what? Uncle Sam is doing this. We should feel really good about it. We have, everyone has faith in the government. They never make mistakes. How did Snowden walk out with four laptop computers loaded with documents? This is not any scholar with a PhD. He was a high school dropout at one time, and he walks out with all this information. Who is protecting the data? So now as a lawyer, you have to worry about your information being taken, your client's information being available, and knowing that it's going to leak. If a Snowden can do this, why can't anyone else easily get access to this information? Now, what are you, how, do you, how does this come about? How does this legally come about? Well, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, FISC, is a secret court. Its opinions are not published, and they issue the orders and allowing the snooping. And the FSA courts sign off on broad orders, and they allow the NSA to use U.S. data without a warrant. Even when a warrants are issued, up to 12, they're issued for 12 months at a time, and it collects almost all the information. If you look at the obligation or they look at what you're author authorized to do, it's one paragraph. It includes everything. And, every, and, and the decision of the NSA analysts, really, it's argued that they make the decision on what to get. And the court, the FSI catch, just is a rubber stamp to what the NSA wants. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's something we need to be concerned about. Well, you say we've got wonderful courts and they do review. I was looking at some of the cases and look at the review that we get. And if you look at that, who is monitoring this? Well, look at who's monitoring it. And look how many of the 6,556 applications to the court that were made, only one has been denied. What kind of monitoring do you think that is? I, I, I would think it's like indicting a ham sandwich in New York, as Judge Wachler once said in his opinion. It's easy to get these warrants. It's easy to get access to this information, whether we like to hear it or not. It's just the reality of things. Uh, public is demanding oversight, and that's because the media got involved. Sometimes I complain about the media, but if the media had not gotten involved, we wouldn't have been also all upset. So on July 8, 2013, the district court decision reject the government's argument that reliance on state secrets is a privilege to avoid litigation. But I will tell you this review has been very limited. The courts have not been involved. And there's a gag order on most of these issues from the court that issues these warrants for the information. There really is no review. And if you look at what's going on, you can decide that there are circumstances now that the companies have to respond. Now, 
This is not the fault of Google, Microsoft, Verizon, or AT&T. They are stuck in the middle. And if you think this is good for their business here in the United States, knowing that they turn over all our information, you're crazy. They are caught between a rock and a hard place. So they're in no position to do anything as well. And what they need to do is to assure the public that they're not going to disseminate your information. So you probably get information now from your carriers telling you they're doing the best they can. But here's the bottom line. The government decides when and if this information is delivered. And trying to, to sway the public's field, the FSA court opinions are usually issued with gag orders. So complying companies can't disclose it. They cannot even disclose to you or anyone else when your information is being taken. So for a company, this is a difficult situation and difficult for everyone around, but this information and the activity of collecting this information is secret. So how is anyone going to do any review of this? Okay, so okay, why do we care as lawyers? What is the issue here? Well, there's a couple of issues here for us. First, we have to do all in our power to uh, communicate with the client and keep the client reasonably informed about a matter. Should you be discussing with your foreign clients and telling them that the opportunity is there if you deal with a foreign client, that their information will be available, including you as a U.S. citizen? Should you tell that client that? Should you tell them as well that the attorney-client privilege, and you'll see later on, that is not immune? as well. Your attorney-client privilege does not prevail over the metadata. They're entitled to look at that unless there's a criminal proceeding pending against you or an indictment about to come down. Should you be advising the client about this? How about your U.S. clients who are now dealing with foreign entities? And I'm sure all our clients that we represent are clean and perfect. Let's say someone is dealing with someone in China and maybe a conversation that uh, we would not necessarily make or maybe some salesperson would make and we discuss about how to increase business and maybe it's illegal. Should we be advising our clients and telling them that whatever you say is going to be made available? It's out there. So if you feel comfortable about what you're doing, be careful. You could be, what you're doing is being watched. It may not be what the government wants, it, you're, but you're exposing yourself. And by the way, when you talk to that foreign client, are you sure that the government, our government, isn't providing that information in cooperation around the world? It presents problems. We have a duty to disclose and explain the exposure to the different clients of what they're exposed to when they deal with foreigners and what this all means to them. We like professional rules. A lawyer must exercise professional judgment and rendered candid advice. A lawyer may refer not only to the law, but to other considerations that may be relevant. That's great. No one likes to talk about unpleasant things. I remember representing, in two, on September 11, 2001, I represented a group of Afghan Americans who were in a dispute with their imam over fundraising in Afghanistan. A simple landlord preliminary injunction. After 9-11, I watched the World Trade Center and I watched the smoke from the World Trade Center from a distance. Did I come by and tell my clients that don't worry now, the government was not looking at you? These were legitimate Afghan Americans who were working hard. I didn't have the courage to tell them, by the way, the spotlight was on them. Only when the FBI showed up to the managing partner's office and talked to him about our representation of these folks did I have the courage to tell them, hey, by the way, you are under a microscope. So we have that. Uh, you look at precautions, we have to take precautions to prevent our attorney-client privileges. We may take reasonable precautions to prevent the information from been disseminating and coming in the hands of unwanted recipients. You have to protect the communications you make through the internet and the phone with your clients. That is your duty. And you must do that. Uh, attorney-client privileges, as I indicated to you before, uh, outside the criminal indictment exception, the NSA can access an attorney-client privilege information and can even preserve it. Attorney-client privilege seems to mean nothing to the NSA, and that information is available unless your client is impending an indictment, and they can use it as they please. Okay, what do we do about this? How do we protect our clients? Well, if your client is a foreign entity, all bets are off. Uh, you cannot do that. The sub it's subject to surveillance. Protection, it's just luck of the draw. Protection, what little exists, extends only to U.S. persons. 
What to do if a client, a U.S. entity, must be dealing with a foreign business? The government can access those records. And a couple of things, this access is better than wiretaps. Okay, you all, we all got past the cloud. The cloud is okay, we can do that. There's an opinion here in the New York State Bar Association about professional ethics opinion that lawyers can store information on the cloud. It's safe to protect attorney-client privilege. Well, what's happening with PRISM? They are collecting the information on the cloud. Now you know that the information that you put about your client are on the cloud and the government can now collect it. What do you need to do? What should you be doing? And if you don't think there's fallout from PRISM, uh, the, I think it's it anticipated that the people in the U.S. cloud industry will lose approximately $35 billion in the next couple of years because of this surveillance and the lack of security. Should you as lawyers be thinking someplace else where you should be storing your information to protect your clients? What do we need to do? Um, We need to advise our clients about the likelihood of information being monitored by the NSA. We need to keep our clients in the loop. That's what we need to do as lawyers. Okay, practical solutions. Don't use the phone or the internet anymore. Then they'll solve it all. Well, that's not gonna work. So maybe you should be Tony Soprano and go to your basement and turn on the air conditioning unit and talk through the phone and have a silencer so nobody will hear what you have. Well, that doesn't work because they only want the metadata, not the content. Hey, You've got to use encryption services to better protect data. You've got to keep up with your ethical obligations. Okay, the statute, I never thought I'd sound like a civil liberties lawyer, and I'm not that, I'm kind of conservative. The intentions are good with the statute. The fallout is bad for all of us. That's the bottom line. The government rationale for snooping is protecting us from the harm by terrorist plots. The NSA director, Keith Alexander, has testified that surveillance programs have prevented approximately 50 terrorist plots worldwide since 2001, and at least 10 of them were targeted in the United States. Pretty good rationale for those of us who live in New York and other places. But what cost for this? What is the cost to our clients and us for doing this? The president has said you can't have 100 percent security and also then have 100 percent privacy. Is President Obama right that we can have both? Or is Benjamin Franklin right that he said that we deserve both? I'll throw this out to you for those who live in New York. If the government had been snooping like they should have been snooping and doing a good job snooping, could 9-11 been averted? We've read in the papers about that. So okay, I get you, we had our college class here. This is not a constitutional law class. I'm not qualified to teach constitutional law, and you don't want to hear about constitutional law. I leave you with this. The fallout is on us as lawyers. We need to protect our clients and advise our clients. So I ask you when you leave this room, advise and protect. And do remember, as lawyers, we promise to uphold the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment. Thank you.